Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Boaz, the Executive Director of the Upper Dublin Education Foundation. And on behalf of our foundation board, I want to welcome you to this very special presentation with Dr. Bradley, entitled A Pandemic Within a Pandemic, Supporting Overwhelmed Teens with Love, Laughter, and the Science of Resilience. Before we start, I just want to take a minute to explain what the Ed Foundation is all about, since some of you might not be familiar with us. Through private support, we strive to enhance educational experiences and fund innovative learning opportunities for our students. We have funded classroom technology like our high school weather stations, STEM and coding programs, lab equipment, musical instruments, software, traveling art exhibits, the Cardinal Opportunities Mentoring Program, just to name a few. And we also help the district pilot big programs like we did a few years ago back with Chromebooks. We hope you learn a little bit more about what we do by visiting our website and following us on Facebook and Instagram. Tonight, we are proud to bring this program to you. The foundation board felt strongly this year about supporting our families in the arena of teen mental health. It is our hope that with the help of Dr. Bradley that you will sign off this Zoom with tangible strategies on how parents can navigate this issue and build resilience in our children. I wanna thank Dr. Yanni and his team for their enthusiasm about this event and for really helping make it happen. And without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our super superintendent, Dr. Yanni. Thank you, Mrs. Boaz, and welcome everyone. As I look at the names appearing in uh, the attendee list, it's so nice to see so many of you here this evening. First, I'd like to thank the Upper Dublin Education Foundation for their sponsorship of this event. Um, the uh, UDEF is a tremendous partner um, in many ways, as Mrs. Boaz explained. Tonight, you get to hear directly from Dr. Bradley about how to support kids uh, during these challenging times. And tonight is just one step in a journey that we're beginning to really focus on social emotional learning and social emotional health in our school district. As I often say uh, at the end of our communications, your kids are my kids. And it's important that we foster great academics, but also that we help kids build persistence, grit, perseverance, and a general sense of well being. Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rita Perez, who serves our community as our Director of Student Services. Thank you, Dr. Yanni, and thank you to the Upper Dublin Education Foundation and Mrs. Boas for um, supporting <clears throat> the presentation with Dr. Bradley this evening. I think we're in for a treat for sure. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind um, participants that we are recording this event. We will have a question and answer format. If you go to the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A icon. You can type your question in there. Um, the question will be visible to the audience, so um, frame your question in a general way. We have with us tonight um, Mr. David Hoffman, our Chief Academic Officer, and Mrs. Meredith Penner, our Supervisor of uh, teaching and learning who will be moderating the Q&A and will also be assisting me in um, the uh, presentation. Before I turn it over to Dr. Bradley, I'd like to take a moment um, to present a brief introduction. Dr. Michael J. Bradley is a licensed clinical psychologist with a doctoral degree in psychology from Temple University. He has over 30 years of experience working with adolescents. In addition, he is the award-winning author of five books, including the best-selling, Yes, Your Teen is Crazy, Loving Your Child Without Losing Your Mind, and Crazy Stressed, Saving Today's Overwhelmed Teens with Love, Laughter, and the Science of Resilience. Dr. Bradley's professional memberships include the American Psychological Association, Pennsylvania Psychological Association, and American College of Forensic Examiners. He is also certified by the American Psychological Association College of Professional Psychology for the treatment of psychoactive substance abuse disorders. His ongoing training qualifies him to offer continuing education units at the seminars he conducts for professionals. To find out more about Dr. Bradley, you can visit his website at docmikebradley.com. Dr. Bradley, we are looking forward to your presentation and 
um, time spent this evening learning how to um, not learning how to make sure our kids are resilient and full of grit and perseverance as they navigate all of today's challenges. Dr. Bradley. Thank you so much, Rita. And after such a wonderful introduction, I guess I'll start by uh, getting into the news. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, <clears throat> the kids are not all right. Um, the first big piece of bad news is that even prior to the pandemic, we were seeing numbers of uh, suffering among our children, young children, teenagers, and young adults that we had never seen before. And this is all pre-pandemic. Uh, over the past five decades, we've seen the instances of anxiety, depression, and suicidal behaviors increase between four and five times. It's a 400, 500% increase in those things. And not just because we look for them more, but hard data show us kids today are indeed suffering more than any other uh, generation we've seen. And this is all pre-pandemic. Since the pandemic hit, our early research numbers are showing you can take those scary numbers I went over and tack on perhaps another 50% that since March, when we went into the shutdown, we've seen an increase again of about another 50% in anxiety, depression, and suicidal behavior. And that's why we came up with this cheery topic title of a pandemic within the pandemic. And it's something we need to stress to parents and educators, anybody who works with kids, that you know the pan pandemic itself, you know, knock on wood, you know, may draw to an end, but the fallout that we're going to have with kids in terms of mental health issues will continue, and that's why we're here tonight to talk about what it is that happens to people when they go through these sorts of trauma, and this is trauma, and what we can do about it, um, and to answer some intriguing questions like how come some people go through these things and don't seem to be hurt too much and other people really are, are wounded and have a hard time handling whatever the trauma were that they dealt with. Coincidentally, those numbers I went over, the pre-pandemic numbers, which are the last we have for the military, about parallel what we see with uh, military folks coming back from deployments in hostile lands. One of my other interests is in working with vets. I'm ex-military, so I stay in touch and help out with some cases now and then. And uh, in looking at that concept of uh, trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in the military, we saw something that was really strange. Uh, of course, the folks coming back that had been through terrible situations, <clears throat> firefights, explosions, and so forth, Understandably, we're showing symptoms of PTSD, but we were seeing the same symptoms in veterans coming back from deployments and hostile lands that never heard a shot fired in anger. The same exact numbers of anxiety, depression, and suicide. And we were intrigued, like, what the heck is that? So we began doing some research on that, and we found that with the veterans, it turns out that just being deployed in a hostile land, in an unfriendly environment, is enough to create this trauma, this PTSD syndrome. And hang in for a minute, because you'll see how it relates to your kids. With the military, we found out that even if you're not in firefights, just being in a land where a lot of people look at you like they wish you weren't there, feeling that hostility, um, those folks develop, a, and I, I say guys, we're talking about men and women, uh, those guys develop a hypervigilance. They're always on guard. Uh, they're worried about what might happen. They hear stories of terrible things that have happened to other people. They may witness, you know, body bags. They hear about the counts and the casualties. And there's other aspects that we hadn't really thought about, which is the financial stresses. People often go from high paying jobs to get called up as reservists, and now they're making next to nothing. But the worst factor in causing this trauma, ironically, turned out to be being separated from people they loved. Remember that as we go through tonight's presentation. And yes, we do have these Zooms, and at least we have this, but there's something that happens in in-person 
uh, contact encounters. There's a magic we cannot reproduce with FaceTime and Zoom. And that's what we saw these military folks struggling with, being away from people they love and being away from the people that love them. So now, how does this relate to our kids? Well, you probably figured it out already. Kids going through this pandemic are in a very similar situation, going through kind of a drip, drip, drip effect that can cause this trauma. They are experiencing fear. They hear the terrible stories. They may know people directly or know of people who have died in this trauma. We're over half a million. We're talking casualties that are beyond uh, the last three wars totaled up. So lots of people know of people who have died. They've seen the stories, they've heard that. And this affects our kids. It's like a background anxiety, this sense of fear. Um, and kids have developed this hypervigilance as well. They're waiting for the next bad thing to happen. They've lost the ability to socialize largely, excuse me, they're not having that in-person contact. Sometimes their family, the shutdown caused a lot of families to disperse as well and to try to do what the vets were doing in their hostile world, trying to make it up with the Zoom and uh, FaceTime, and it just doesn't work. Worst of all, kids are reporting this feeling of aloneness and a lack of control, um, feeling like they really do not have a central control over the outcome of their lives which is something we found in the vets, because when you're deployed to a hostile area, you're not so sure what's gonna to happen to you. And you get this sense of foreboding that it's not really in your hands anymore, uh, what's going to happen to you in the future. And that's what our children, our teenagers in particular, are describing, a loss of control, of a central control over the outcome of their lives. And that's a big piece of this depression, anxiety, and suicidal thinking. And if that wasn't enough, a huge percentage of these kids are not doing well at school. Some can make it up with the cyber effects, some cannot, um, and they do fall behind. And school becomes uh, a big identifying factor for them. That's their primary job. So even with all that, again, when we study the vets, not all the vets that come back had PTSD. A lot of vets come back and do just fine. They say, well, that kind of sucked and you know, let's get on with my life again and seem to shrug it off. And even in a long-term research, they do not seem to have terrible symptoms. And it's the same with the kids. Not all kids coming through this are going to have these symptoms. That not all kids are going to respond poorly. Um, and when we tried to figure that out with kids pre-pandemic, what we found is that there are differences between human beings going through trauma that really predict very well how they're going to respond. Are they going to be okay and just say, well, that was pretty rotten, let me move on? Or are they going to sink and have long-term, really disabling sorts of symptoms? Um, to try to explain the key factor between those two groups, let me tell you about uh, two soldiers I worked with uh, this was back when Iraq was happening hot and heavy, and we had a lot of roadside explosions, and I had two cases I was called in on. The first one was somebody who lost a leg, a right leg, in an explosion, and he predictably uh, was in bed, would not get out of bed, would not see anyone. Uh, he wouldn't see his family, wouldn't see his girlfriend, and he promised to end his life at the first opportunity. And, and that's probably how I think I would react if we went through something that horrific, right? His whole life was turned upside down. And by the way, these soldiers are teenagers. We forget that. A lot of them are 18 and 19 and 20. Uh, not dissimilar at all to the teenagers you may have at home. So that was the first guy. Um, then I got a call about 18 months later for a second one. They said we have another traumatic amputee. Traumatic amputation means you lose a limb in an explosion. And I said, let me guess, he won't get out of bed. And they said, no, get this, we can't keep him in bed. He's constantly on the move and he shouldn't be. He's not accepting the required bed rest. He's doubling his physical therapy. Uh, he's roaming the halls. 
He's formed these informal help groups. He gets up whenever a new vet is coming in and greets them and hugs them and says, hey, we're here for you. It's a band of brothers, a band of sisters. And these are our groups and they're constantly moving and doing. And they said, we're frankly afraid he's gonna hurt himself. He's not taking care of his rehab the way he should. So I went to see this guy and he's like annoyed that they send the shrink in to see him. And you know, he's ask, answering a couple of questions and he finally says, yeah, Bradley, I know why you're here. I said, you do? He said, yeah, you're here because the hospital staff is worried about me, right? I said, well, yeah. And then he said, and I know what you're thinking. And I said, well, what am I thinking? He said, you're thinking that I'm doing all this stuff that I do as a way of avoiding my pain, right? You think that I don't want to deal with my pain and my loss, and that's why I do this stuff. And I said, well, yeah, the thought had sort of crossed my mind. Um, and he said, man, you know, I feel the pain. Uh, don't tell me I don't feel the pain. I wake up in the middle of the night crying. He said, I cry from pain from a leg I don't have anymore, something called phantom pain, phantom limb, limb syndrome. He said, I feel the pain, but I gave that freaking war my leg. I'm not giving it another inch of my life. So Bradley, if you want to help me, you get the VA guy in here because he's not returning my calls. I want to find out about my benefits. I want to go back to school and get this. By the way, I don't want that walking prosthetic. I want a runner's prosthetic. You know, just learning how to walk on a false leg is like amazingly hard to run on one is Star Wars sort of stuff. And this is where this guy was. What was the difference between those two veterans? They both went through the same horrific injury, the same trauma, unimaginable pain, fear, and loss, and a 180 degree difference in the way they responded. What was the difference? Something called resilience. What is resilience? Well, it's actually a set of skills and assets that uh, things that can be learned, that can be taught, that can be fostered through parenting at any age. It's stuff that we're now doing with people who have been in prison for decades, uh, trying to help them learn to be resilient to help them survive their situation and do better when they get out of the prison. Um, it is not what some people think when they talk about grit. Grit is a, a different animal that can be part of resilience, but resilience is not some magical ability to not feel pain or fear or hopelessness. Remember that second vet, he said, you know, don't tell me I don't feel the pain. In fact, Developing resilience requires feeling pain. It requires some degree of struggle so that people can then begin to employ these skills and assets that we're gonna be going over. Another way to picture it is as emotional buoyancy, if you will, with those two vets or two teenagers that are going through this terrible time. Picture them as boats on the sea and there's a tremendous storm and a monstrous wave overwhelms both boats and they both go down, they both go under the water. One continues all the way down to the bottom. The other goes down, it takes the hit, but it bounces back up to the surface. That's essentially what resilience is. It's not some capability to avoid pain or trauma, but it is a capability to take the hit, to go down, to feel horrible, to bounce back to the surface and move along not just as before, but even stronger than before the trauma hit. So tonight, what I want to do is to review those seven factors. We had uh, research done primarily by American Academy of Pediatrics and a guy named Ken Ginsberg at CHOP. Uh, I have to give him credit because I stole all his stuff, uh, but he's, he's good natured about it. But uh, they did the legwork on this and the research was massive but we were able to kind of boil it down into these seven factors that um, give us an easy way of remembering the pieces that go into trying to build resilience in children. Um, there's two reasons I, I want you to know this. One is for the immediate trauma. For sure, these are things we wanna to try to build into our kids' lives as much as we can. But again, just to forewarn you, research from past trauma past bad things that have happened, <clears throat> such as 9-11, <clears throat> excuse me, or the pandemic of 1918, uh, we found that 
the mental health effects last a long time, particularly among young people. They tend to be a little more vulnerable than those of us who are a little bit older uh, to the impact of these sorts of traumas. Now, as we go over the seven C's, a word of caution, people get overwhelmed when they look at the list and all the things we're suggesting. Don't freak out. Uh, just think of these things as guidelines. Um, we want you to view them in two ways. One, to see the seven C's themselves, these uh, things that we'll be discussing with the title, uh, such as competency, those are the strategies. In the military metaphor, we talk about strategies and tactics. Strategy is kind of a global uh, uh, goal, something that we employ to try to accomplish a mission. Your mission as parents is to help your kids through this rough time. The strategy is kind of the global target, and then we're gonna do some specific tactics, which are sort of the day-to-day -day things you can try to build in to accomplish these things. Again, don't get overwhelmed. Nobody can do all this stuff. You just read it over and keep it in mind as you're going through the day-to-day -day decisions with your kids, which things to emphasize, which kids to de-emphasize. Um, you will see some overlap when we talk about the tactics because when we kind of melded this stuff together, it turned out that there was a lot of general parenting principles that apply to a number of the seven C's we'll be discussing. And uh, they're really kind of a, an overall grid, if you will, of how to do parenting in this day and age. And that's why you have a second handout, I think that's available to you on the website here, uh, which we call the 10 Commandments of Parenting for Resilience. And that will give you kind of the down and dirty, what to do when sorts of things with the kids that complements this resilience building, if you will. So with that being said, um, can we punch up the seven C's? And we're gonna talk about the first one, which is competence. And what is competence? Competence is actually a specific set of abilities and skills to help somebody learn to handle particular situations effectively. Um, and they can only be learned by actually getting in a game and acquiring a skill through actual experience. Uh, and that can be learning a language, learning how to play baseball, learning how to play the piano, uh, drawing, things like that. Because um, in building those things, a lot of sub-skills get built as they acquire those skills. It helps kids to learn to trust their judgments, to make responsible choices, and the most important perhaps is be accepting of failure, that uh, failure is part and parcel of learning and gaining new skills. So as parents, what are some of the things you can do to encourage that? First, encourage any and all activities, structured or not, whether you think they're uh, helpful or not, it doesn't matter. When it comes to competence building, we say, it, it doesn't matter what the kid does. Uh, it doesn't matter what the thing is, as long as that thing is no thing. We want kids engaged in stuff. And if they're gonna go for the baseball team and the debate team or you know, the summer science enrichment program at John Hopkins, well, okay. Uh, I'll tell you that they're actually gonna learn more doing the stupid things that make people, parents crazy like me. When my son Ross decided he was gonna be a, heavy metal musician. He says it's not heavy metal, but I forget how he describes his music. Um, but, you know, it made me crazy because he's he was a genius and, uh, you know, was, thought he was wasting his time. And then it hit me. He was learning 10 times more in running this goofy band, sorry, Ross, that he was running at the time. If you think about it, what goes into running a band? Well, you're managing personalities, it's human resources and personalities of musicians are difficult to manage. Uh, negotiating with venues on fees, contracts, planning, budgeting. I thought, holy mackerel, this is incredible what he's getting out of this. So try not to pick on what the kid is doing. Be thankful that they're willing to do anything and short of something that can hurt them. Be supportive about what it is they're doing and show an interest in it. Um, 
so that can be the bands, it could be the, the gay straight alliance at school, it can be you know, planting trees on a turnpike stop, whatever the kid has an interest in, get interested in their interest, show support for that. As they're doing it, say a lot about what they do well. Kids are so sick of hearing what they do wrong. I one time had a teenager say, you know what my life is like? I wake up hearing, I didn't wake up on time. I then hear how I'm late for the bus. And then I hear that I don't have my homework done the way it should have been done. And then I hear that uh, Johnny was bad mouthing me. And then I hear the teacher yelling at me because I'm not paying attention. And then I hear the coach yelling at me because I can't field grounders to the left and on and on. They hear all day long what's wrong with them. Hearing what's right with them is rare. You gotta look for it sometimes, but find things to tell them that are positive say as little as possible about their screw ups. When they do uh, make a mistake and you want to review it with them, always stay narrow focused. Do not say you always do this. You never get up on time. Um, be very careful with those sweeping statements. They're, they're very uh, anti-resilient sorts of policies. Do say, if, if it's a major flaw, say something like, look, if you had this to do over again, what would you do differently? So you're asking for learning on their part, get the wheels turning in their head. Guys, it's with teenagers in particular, stop lecturing. You ever see the, the, the uh, cartoons about kids hearing parents going wah, wah, wah? There's more truth and humor in that. By the time they get to be teenagers, certainly by 14, 15, they've heard it all from us. Uh, so stop the lectures, start switching to questions lob in questions. Parenting teenagers is a lot like guerrilla warfare. You run up to your opponent's wall and you lob a hand grenade over and then you run the hell away. Uh, you don't go nose to nose and have these Gettysburg kind of battles. That doesn't work out so good. It's the same with teenagers. Lob in a well-crafted question. Like, what do you think about that? If you had it to do ever, would you do something different? Don't argue their answers. Just get them to say something and acknowledge it and wait till they've said all they can and, and let it go. Stop the lecturing. Less is more when you're trying to teach teenagers. Next, with <laughs> uh, competencies, let them make mistakes. Let them make mistakes. We've decided that mistakes, that failing is somehow a, a, a fatal experience for children and we have really robbed them. <laughs> Guys, think about your own life. What did you learn more from? Uh, what are the things that helped you to be successful today? It, was it your successes or was it your failures? I'll get together with you know old friends back from back in the day and they'll say, hey, remember when you did X, Y, Z positive things? And I'm like, uh, no, that was me, really? No, I don't recall that. But I'll tell you my failures in exquisite detail. I keep them up here because I learned so much from being stupid, making bad decisions, saying, man, I'll never do that again, that's done. And wisdom comes from making those mistakes, surviving them, hopefully. So if it's not something that can kill them or horrendously alter their lives, let them make mistakes. You can say, I don't know if that's a good idea. I know what I'm doing, leave me alone. Say, all right, cool. Let me know if I can help. If what they're doing is going to work out well, that's a win. If it works out poorly, that's a win. Guys, another mantra is the bad decision made well is much better than the good decision made poorly. Good decision made poorly, that's where we hound our kids into doing the right thing. And they finally give up. We berate them and pound them into choosing some class we want them to take or doing some activity. If they make the choice and it's a good choice, congratulations. If it's a bad choice, congratulations. If you let them choose, because then they have nobody to blame but themselves. Don't pile on, just say, hey, if you had it to do over, what would you do differently? And that's where learning comes from. By the way, if it's a psychological issue that you want them to be dealing with, um, again, don't fear the failure because ironically, the beginning of psychological change is anger at self. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about punishments versus consequences. We'll come back to it.
Oh, before I forget, don't compare them to other people. Please don't do that. We, we lose it at times. We think we're being helpful. Why can't you be more like your sister? Look at her. She, she does really well. She doesn't complain about her homework. Boy, you might as well stick them in the stomach with a needle. You know, it's just so painful to hear comparisons to others. Just uh, uh, honor them as individuals. Never do a compare and contrast with somebody else. Okay, the next strategy, again, the overall category is confidence. Um, and what is confidence? Confidence can be defined as uh, projecting competence into the future. People say their kids are not very confident. We usually say, go back and check out uh, that first C of competence, because if they have acquired some skills and they've been able to experience success and failure, work things through, they start to feel better about themselves. And that feeling better about, hey, I learned how to speak Chinese, something else a lot of kids are doing through the pandemic. I don't know why, but I've had three clients that decided to learn how to speak Chinese because there was nothing else to do. Uh, that helps them feel good. Like, hey, I could learn that really hard to speak language. And that gives them a sense of, well, whatever the next challenge is, I think I can do that next challenge. So what can we do as parents to build confidence? First is expect the best. Now, before you say, yeah, I want all A's and <clears throat> I want that 350 batting average, that ain't what I'm talking about. Expect the best not of achievement, but of the personal qualities that are critical to achievement. Things such as fairness, integrity, persistence, also noted as known as grit, and kindness. Um, those are the keys. It's all about focusing on the heart first. Uh, you talk about social emotional learning. Yeah, those are the pieces to do first. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. But when we focus on batting averages versus being a good team player, supporting the kid who struck out and people laughed at him, when we, when we focus on the average, we are doing a disservice to our kid. When we focus on how you supported that kid who got laughed at, that's the goal. Those are the things we wanna be looking at when we talk about <clears throat> expecting the best in our children. When they fail, do not say you always do this, what's wrong with you, how could you be like that, blah, blah, blah. A good phrase, if it's a heavy thing where they joined in to mocking the kid who struck out, is to say, you know, I know you're better than that. So always be showing them the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the hopefulness, and then asking them, what would you do differently the next time? Um, Next, don't treat them as being stupid. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if they're stupid, man, I was certainly stupid and I suspect you were too. We're all people learning how to navigate the world. And these are creatures who, again, are very sensitive to failure because that's what they do mostly and that's what they hear about mostly. Try to shift the frame, letting them know that mistakes are actually wonderful learning opportunities uh, one of the phrases we use is uh, symptoms, not sins. I had a kid in the office today telling me, well, he's a horrible human being, he's a failure, and his parents hate him because of something he did um, that was pretty typical. And if that was the worst thing that I ever did, he's doing great. Um, but he had internalized it as, as a sin. And when kids do that, then they, they don't learn. They actually create something called shame. They feel less than. Shame is very different than guilt. Guilt is actually a positive emotion. Um, guilt is, man, that was stupid. I'm better than that. I gotta fix it. I gotta make it up. I gotta say sorry, whatever. That's fine. That's all part of the human experience. Shame is, look at what a horrible person I am. I'm a loser. I've always been a loser. I always will be a loser. And shame only sets up more loss and more self-hatred. Shame is toxic. Guilt is fine, it's okay. You feel guilty, congratulations. You're telling me you have a code that you told yourself you violated. Let's go back and fix it, that's all. That's how we all learn. Um, encourage them, oh, praise them often, but honestly about specific achievements. Guys, don't BS them. 
uh, kids hate that. It actually makes them feel despondent. Oh, you're the best player in the in the whole county. Yeah, you're the prettiest girl in the whole school. Don't do that. Uh, even if you think it's true, it's just not a good thing to do. But rather praise specific achievements, particularly achievements of the heart. When you see them being kind to the younger sister, you point that out and just you're all over that, like white on rice saying, man, I know your sister can be annoying and you were patient. You held your temper and you were nice to her and you helped her with that thing. I am so freaking proud of you. Wow, you're really growing up. So look for real things that they do and then heap on the praise. Don't make up universal glowing statements they know are BS. It makes them feel like they're invalids and parents have to make stuff up that they're the best and the prettiest and the smartest and all that. Look for actual things and then dig in on actual achievements. Um, encourage kids to push themselves. Don't push them. Guys, this is an important one. And I know it sounds like we're back and forth and threading the needle, but it's, it's important that you do what you can to help them make decisions to try things that they might be afraid of. Um, you can again use those questions, <clears throat> those hand grenades over the wall. Like when a kid is back and forth about, oh, I don't know if I you know, try out for the swim team, I might not make it, I'd be embarrassed. You can just say, well, you know, what do you have to lose? Um, what bad thing can happen? There's a, there's a technique we teach called the two question technique. And again, you're not telling them what to do. You're just helping them process their own feelings. Um, and you say to them, question one, what exactly are you afraid of? And the kid might say, I'll get cut from the team. Well, then you push it further. You say, so? And they'll say, well, then I'll, my name will be on a list saying I got cut. So, well, then I'll be embarrassed because everybody will know. So, well, that's it. I'll be embarrassed. So now you've identified the root fear. Then you go to question two. So on this thing that you're afraid of that you'll be embarrassed, is that a horror or is that an annoyance? And at first they'll say, well, that's a horror. And you say, well, have you thought about a horror that's happened in the world recently? Yeah, about half a million people dead from a virus. Okay, that qualifies as a horror. Being embarrassed because you don't make a swim team. Son, is that a horror or is that an annoyance? I guess it's an annoyance, right? Do you want to let annoyances make your choices? That's sort of letting fear make your choices. You decide what to do, but you know, think about it, please. <clears throat> Again, don't push for the outcome you want, but rather push to get the wheels turning in the kid's head. It's a no-lose situation. If they duck trying out, then you can say, how do you feel about having not tried out? The odds are they say, I feel crummy. What would you do the next time? I, I would push myself to try out. Cool. And if they tried out and they lost, they got cut. That's terrific. Say, I'm so proud of you. That's hard to do. That's the secret. Uh, the best hitters in baseball, the absolute top of the heap, hit maybe 300, 350. What's that mean? Seven times out of 10, they screw up. That They learn how to deal with failure because that's part of learning to be successful. Um, okay. <clears throat> the next C is connections. Um, Guys, if you have to pick one C, if somebody says you can only do one thing on this list, this one is it. Um, and I think you already know where I'm headed with this one. What are connections? Connections are kind of this invisible energy lifeline that uh, connects one person's heart to another. I don't know how else to describe it. We've researched this. We can't find any device that picks it up. But boy, we sure see the impact of connections, of human connection, one to another. Um, there's something you should punch up on that. I don't need the slide on this, guys, but there's something called the uh, Order of the Good Time in Nova Scotia. And this is something that dates from the 1600s. Um, and they had this uh, early settlement, the first settlement that in Nova Scotia. And that first terrible winter they went through, everybody held, kind of holed up in their own cabins alone isolated, sound familiar, and they had staggering fatality rates. The second winter, they came up with this idea about we're not going to hole up 
apart from each other through the horrible winter, we're going to meet every night in this hall they built, and we're going to share whatever meager provisions we have, and we take turns trying to have a good time. The different committees, they do things like put on a show, a play, <clears throat> sing songs, play games, ridiculous stuff, but they all work together every night through essentially the same brutal winter, and they cut the fatality rate in half. And that was the beginning of the understanding about how connection, how uh, socialization um, is critical to our biological survival. It was the beginning of the understanding of that you know, mind and body connection of things like morale. Connections are the key. So what are the jobs <clears throat> for us to do as parents under the heading of connection? The first is be sure you're promoting physical safety and emotional security within the home. What does that mean? Guys, we have to get anger and rage out of parenting. I, I know that may sound insulting and trust me, being ex-military and Irish Catholic, I can rage as good as any of you. Ask my kids. Uh, when I, I lose it, I can be scary. But the point is we have to do as much as we can to eliminate those things um, and if we can't, by the way, that's another gift. I wrote in one of my books about having lost it on my son. I was very justified in chasing him up the steps and yelling at him. I wasn't yelling, I was screaming. Here's my wife's picture behind me. I can't tell the, the soft truths with her over me. That's all the great stuff she's done in the world, by the way. She's going to hate that I said that. But in any event, um, yeah, and, and after doing that, then... You know, as I got that look from my wife about, you know, whoa, I was over the top, I apologized to my son. Um, guys, if you're using anger, and most of us do at times, understand it doesn't fix anything. It can control immediate behavior. It doesn't teach. And it certainly is not worth the cost to connections, which is the key to resilience. So what did I do after I flipped out on my son and knocked on the door and said, Ross, he said, yeah. I said, can I come in? He said, yeah. And he was in there. You know, he was eight years old when I screamed at him because uh, he had upset our newly adopted daughter. And I was doing the manly thing, right? You know, protecting her. And he had tear tracks. He had been crying. And I said, man, I am so sorry. That was not about you. That wasn't what you did. That was me. You know, I am not proud at all about what I did. I, I intend to do better. I am so sorry. And I walked out. So if you flip out, if you've been using anger, use apology. If I ever tried lecturing to my son, Ross, who gave me this hideous tie as a joke to embarrass me, we'll get into that story later. If I ever tried lecturing to him, I get the same response you get, lecturing to your kids about things like owning your behaviors, uh, wrestling with imperfections, striving to do better. You know what they hear after word five out of your mouth? Wah, wah, wah. But if you blew up, if you use rage, if you ridiculed them, and then you go back in and make yourself small by apologizing, you'll never be bigger in your life. And they will learn. They'll hear you talking about owning behavior, wrestling with imperfection, striving to do better. And those are incredible gifts to model, not preach, at your children. So as much as you can, get the anger out of the parenting. And when you fail, as we all do, then clean it up. Be the thing you want to see with your kids. Uh, <clears throat> remind them that you are crazy in love with them, especially in conflict. Guys, when, when we conflict, by the way, if you didn't notice, parenting teenagers in particular is a conflict-based relationship. If you haven't figured that out, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you. It's the way it is. It's the nature of the beast, and it's okay. They learn a lot through the conflict if it's done properly. How is it done properly? You separate the personal from the business. What's the business? Uh, business is, no, you can't go down the shore with your gangster friends for the weekend. Um, that's not gonna happen. Not you're crazy, I hate you. Don't let them feel that the business decision means you are breaking the connection with them. So it's fine to say that, hey, I love you. In fact, I love you too much to let you do this thing because it could hurt you terribly. You're not ready to solo down the shore yet. Nothing personal. Um, a great phrase to remember. I love you too much. 
when you're telling them no to something they desperately want to do. Um, allow them to express all their emotions. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail on this, this guy. So are you because you sponsored this. When they say, I hate you, a lot of parents say, I don't allow that. Okay, what's your option? Tell them just to think it, just to feel it, and they're not allowed to say it. No, if my kid hates me, I want to hear about it. I need to know. They said, she says, I really hate you right now. I say, thank you for telling me. Tell me about it. I want to know how you feel. Honor their emotions. If they feel safe enough to tell you that they hate you, you can trust when they say, I love you. Uh, it's You can't pick the feelings you want to get from the kid. You take the feelings and accept them or you don't. You break the connection with them and you give them a message that their feelings are wrong or inappropriate. So even that you know terrible H word, roll with it because we typically really hate in families, we hate the people we love. So it's the flip side of the same coin. Um, <clears throat> model positive conflict resolution. <clears throat> so as they're talking about um, you know, the fight, the thing that they want to do that you can't let them do that, just keep coming, trying to bring it back. Don't get baited into the screaming and yelling, but bring it back to saying, I just want to let you know, I do love you. I really disagree with what you're saying, but I love you. It's something politically, you know, we've kind of lost in, in our country saying, hey, it's just business. It's not personal. Um, and you can see what happens when business becomes personal in our country and it destroys families. Most of all, it destroys those connections between human beings. Uh, use consequences versus punishments. This is explained more in the Ten Commandments <clears throat> of parenting. In the first commandment, we say, be as a dispassionate cop. Um, and that essentially is talking about the difference between punishment and consequence. What's a punishment? Punishment is stupid. There's a, there's a pejorative word. Uh, punishments don't work. That's when we hurt somebody for being hurtful. Um, so that's when a kid walks in the door, you can smell the beer on his breath, and we go crazy. We take their phone, we take their guitar, we ground them till they're 37 and a half years old. We hurt them because they did something that scared us or we thought was hurtful. That is just outrageous. It's, it's kind of like being a cop who pulls you over for a stop sign offense and goes through your purse, your pocketbook, and takes your cell phone and takes your music and you know erases all your music. <clears throat> um, it, you would just be, you'd be in the streets. You'd be a revolutionary. Uh, a consequence is a cop that says, hey, I sorry, I saw you go through that stop sign. I'll get you out of here as soon as I can. No yelling, screaming, no, you know, I'm going to sit here, drink my coffee and make you more late for work. But brings you a ticket, gives you a ticket that you knew was coming. You knew in advance what the rule was. You made a choice to blow the stop sign. So when the dispassionate cop who is, doesn't use rage or anger or sarcasm, gives you the ticket, who are you mad at? Yourself. Guys, remember anger itself is the beginning of psychological change. So with kids, always try to use consequences. There's a terrible problem with that, which is they're gonna think of bad things to do that you didn't tell them in advance what the choices were, but as much as you can, Try to tell them in advance. For example, the first time they're doing a sleepover, which is where the drugs come out, say, just to let you know, I'm trusting you will make good decisions. If you don't make good decisions, if I find out you've used, then can we agree that you're not ready for the freedom of, of being away at sleepovers? Um, and we're going to set them down for about three months, and then we'll try it again because you're smart, you're a good kid, you'll figure it out, you'll learn how to make good decisions. And she says, what? I can't have sleepovers? I said, no, you can't have them here at our house. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'll get the pizza and the movies, you know? And she says, the kids won't come to our house. And you say, gee, why is that, sweetheart? Uh, a lot of the stuff does go on in other people's houses. So you have to be careful. So set the consequence in advance. So if she does roll in with beer on her breath, assuming she's not drunk, if she's drunk, you know, go online and read about the protocol to be sure she's safe. Uh, be sure she hasn't drunk so much she's in danger. But if it's the typical beer or two first time, then you say, ah, oh, you know, remember we talked, so we're going to retire the sleepovers for three months. 
she made a decision knowing what the outcome of the choice would be. And that's where she lies in bed angry at herself for being dumb with her choice versus being angry at you because you made something up. So the first time they do something that you hadn't anticipated, have the discussion versus do things to hurt them, to create punishments. What's the discussion like? Well, the day after the beer drinking incident, uh, sit them down because they're waiting to get grounded for 20 years. And you say, tell me what you learned. And she'll stare at you like, what? So yeah, tell me what you learned. You might hit gold. She might say, oh, actually what I learned is the stuff tastes stupid and you know, kids got crazy. Johnny jumped on Susie in the park and, you know, Billy was puking and I, I don't get it, mom. Well, she's learned a lot. Congratulations. <clears throat> when she says, what's my punishment? Say, eh, I'm not into that. However, if it happens again, can we agree? Yada, yada, yada. So always go to consequences. They're dispassionate. You get the anger out of them. Wherever you can, you put the power in the kids' hands to make choices. You maintain the connection. Beg, borrow, and steal for those connections. I know a lot of you, excuse me, are writing questions saying, well, my kid won't be seen within 10 linear feet of me or allow me in their door or the bedroom. How do I connect with them? I have two suggestions. You do whatever you can. Beg, borrow, steal, bribe them. I bribed my son one time to go get a coffee with me, and he thought it was hysterical. You know, it's kind of showing the $5 bill as we walked out the door. It's kind of like he had my battle flag to the family. 20 minutes later, he's yakking away at Starbucks. Uh, do whatever it takes to have these connections. Don't ask them, you know, what's going on with this homework. Just see if they'll chat and listen. That stuff is gold for connections. And then a couple of the parents gave me tricks I wish I had thought of. One was a mom who said that her daughter was doing the, uh, I'm not talking to you for a week thing. By the way, mothers and daughters, watch out. Most powerful relationship on the face of the planet for better and for worse. And one of the worst times, <clears throat> the daughter wouldn't talk to mom. And mom said, I just kind of lost it. And I got a silver platter <clears throat> and I filled two water pistols and I walked into her bedroom and I said, choose your weapon. And she said, you're you know, bad word. Get out of here, mom. You know, it's stupid. And mom said, okay, and picked up one of the guns, start to shoot her in the head with a water pistol. And the daughter is screaming and yelling and finally picks up the other water pistol and shoots back at mom. And mom said, the next thing you know, they were chasing each other through the house, laughing hysterically, soaking each other. And all the men were staring like, what's happening now? And they were remembering they were connected and <clears throat> remembering they loved each other. Another mom said uh, the son was doing the same thing. Get away from me, mom. And she uh, remembered she had this purple lipstick from back in the day and a sombrero from an unfortunate trip to Tijuana, as she put it. And she puts on all this purple lipstick and the sombrero <clears throat> and then went into her son's bedroom and started to chase him around the room saying, give me kish, give me kish, give me kish, chased him downstairs and everybody's laughing and screaming hysterically. Do whatever it takes to break ice short of hurting somebody. Try to keep selling, keep reaching out. I know you get rejected a lot, but kids tell me how sad they get when mom stop or dad stop reaching out, even if you get rejected all the time. It feels like the loss of the connection, as weird as that sounds. Dr. Okay. Bradley? Yes, ma'am. If I could, I... Um... There is a couple questions submitted, and this might be a good time as they, I think, relate to some of these seeds that you've already discussed. Okay. Um, one of uh, one of the uh, pieces is around parameters and boundaries with with students with the with their children. Um, we're wondering, you know, when is it time? When can we be? When can we relax our expectations for our kids and give them some um, leeway? For example, the balance between you know doing um, chores at home and screen time or phone time and family time, how do we how do we manage through that? Especially now that we're in a pandemic and we're with each other all day long. You have to prioritize those expectations. <clears throat> I know a lot of parents are really worried about uh, the impact on school and grades going down and so forth. <clears throat> what you really are focusing on are issues of the heart. And that's where you wanna do things about keeping them involved with chores. Kids feel better 
when they do chores. So do what you can. Um, and it works best to start with the least intrusive intervention, say things like, I could really use the help. Um, you know, it's, I got a lot going on here. If you could do this, I would appreciate it. Balancing screen time, same thing. You, you do that as a stepwise progression. And that begins by, and this stuff is all online. It begins by saying, what do you think about the amount of time you're putting into screens? And they'll say, I think it's fine. Say, how many hours do you think you're doing? Oh, two hours a day. Really? Well, let's log it. And the screens will log this. And you look at it and say, wow, it turns out it's 12 hours a day. Do you think that's a lot? And see if they can cut back on their own. But if they can't, then you gradually increase the pressure with things like, sorry, psychologists, bribes. Uh, okay, incentives. Offer them incentives to do things other than the screen time. Um, because they will feel better doing in vivo things as much as you can. If that doesn't work, then you go to the next step where you say, sorry, but you know, I am worried about the screen sucking you in. So I'm going to ask for a balance. Can you put in as much time in other things as you are in the screens? And if you have to, you may say after a week, if that's not working, then we're just going to have the screen shut off, say at, at nine o'clock at night. Sorry. Uh, because I do feel that, you know, they're getting to be addicting. So you start softly and then work your way up, hoping that the kid learns. Remember, if you just march in there and shut off the screen, there's no learning that goes on. If you pull the plug, then you're just kind of deferring the real problem. Maybe until the kid is 3,000 miles away at age 18 at a college, and we have a lot of kids whose parents gave them no access to screens, who then go nuts in that first semester at school. I get a lot of these cases at Christmas break. Your mission as a parent is not to control your kid. Your mission is to help your child learn to control herself. So that's why you do this slowly, offering incentives, beg, borrowing, or stealing. And as a last resort, you may have to walk in and actually have the thing shut down just to help them disengage. The screens are addicting. Uh, they're actually built by the dark side psychologists to be addicting. Um, so they may need help to, to get, uh, to be able to detach from the screen. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. And I think there's a, a similar um, question in terms of um, expectations for um, students, you know, uh, for my child academically. I'm thinking, you know, back to 10 years ago when I, I could have used a lot of this advice um, then, but uh, <laughs> for sure. But, um, you know, how do we, how do we during these critical academic years know how far we can push our child, especially if they're dealing with anxiety or depression? Um, you know, when, when I have to remind my child every day uh, about doing doing their work and getting their work done. How do I how do I balance that while still respecting the fact that she's she's actually you know going through some issues herself? Well, um, the idea is to try to work cooperatively with the kid, and that's where you go back to the questions, and that's where you say you know I, I got a couple of texts from the teachers. Looks like you know you're really not doing the work. You don't say what's wrong with you, get the goddamn working. You say, can I ask you how you feel about that? Because most kids will feel really crummy about it. Um, you may have to get past a sarcastic response, but the truth is almost every one of them wants to be doing the work and wants to be doing okay. So once you get that, you say, great, how can we work cooperatively to help you with this? Again, don't go in like the Marines. Your mission is not to control. It's to help her learn to control herself, to make better decisions. And that's where you say, what can I do? Can we you know, do some time uh, together? If I can support you, get somebody in to help support you. Um, the screens are just so difficult for these kids that you need to give them some leeway and understand they're not going to be doing really well. But uh, kids can catch up on the academics. It's not the end of the world. Uh, be careful about what hill you want to die on um, because they can learn the skills. It's the heart aspects you want to focus on and you want to be uh, sure that you're not 
getting grades at the price of raising their depression, anxiety, or wanting to not live. Um, so trade those things off as you can. Uh, trust that your kid wants to do well. Try to link with that part um, and, and build from there. And don't be afraid to try you know, a well-placed bribe again. Offer incentives for the work. School is so frustrating for them because school is 100,000 small tasks that doesn't pay off for a decade down the road to many, for many kids. So give them some incentive to do any kind of piece. They will feel better. The extrinsic bribe will fall away because they start to feel better as they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. It becomes an internal payoff. Great. Um, one last um, question before um, we continue on with the with your seven C's. Um, you know, teenagers they've experienced so much um, disappointment and and loss during this pandemic. Um, you know, for instance, the teen has lost um, an opportunity for a much desired, you know, summer programming experience, didn't make a sports team that they tried out for um, and worked hard for and tried out for. And, you know, while these are life lessons, my child has fallen into a depression and has started to do some self-harming behavior, self-injurious behavior. Um, and doesn't want to revisit group therapy um, that they had attended before. How do we convince our child that they need to get into therapy and need to seek some help? Okay. First of all, uh, self-injury. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand that. They see it as suicide. Um, usually it's not. Self-injury, uh, I had a kid one time tell me, yeah, I cut myself so I don't suicide. It's a way of trying to manage a uh, really painful emotion. Um, so what you wanna do is try to not be shocked by that or terrified by it, but just to say, I can see you're really in pain. I can see that you're going to this uh, kind of a length to adjust your brain chemistry. Say there's better ways to do it. Now, uh, I don't know that group therapy is necessarily the way to go. It's really tough for kids, uh, teenagers. Sometimes it works but often they're, they're really fearful of ridicule. Having them see somebody one-on-one -on -one is, is much better uh, for that sort of a situation. Um, and again, you get resistance, but do the two question technique, what exactly are you afraid of? Is that thing a horror or a frustration, an annoyance? And then secondly, offer them the bribe again. Well, they may just have to get past the anticipatory anxiety. Uh, in Eastern philosophy, they say it's not the tiger, it's the fear of the tiger that does the most damage. And if you get them past the, the fear part to confront the thing they're afraid of, usually it goes fine. And a kid who is self-injuring, she knows, I'm assuming it's a she, it's mostly she's, um, she knows something's up and she knows she's in trouble. If you just get her across the threshold to see a good uh, licensed mental health professional, that's part of why they cut. And it's part of why you found out. It's part of why they post it. They want somebody to say, hey, there's better ways to handle this. So try to work cooperatively. Another trick is lay it out. Don't ask for an immediate answer. Say, I found this, this woman, she seems great. I'd like you to see her a couple of times. And then you decide if you hate this therapist, we don't have to go back but I do want you to see her one time. I'm kind of you know, really pushing that. Think about it. I'll check with you tomorrow. If you push for an immediate answer, you'll get no. It's kind of a rule of parents have. Don't push me or you'll get no. It's the same with kids. Then you go back the next day. Say, hey, did you think that over? And you may have to up the ante a little bit. And then you may have to say, I'm going to have to insist, sweetie. You know, if you're doing this to yourself, man, that's, that's a lot of pain. Not you're stupid or you're crazy. But you're really hurting. So... Uh, this is a symptom. It's not a sin. If you had you know, crushing chest pressure and numbness in your left arm, would you say, no, I'm not going to the doctor? Would you say, wow, what's up with this symptom? I got to get it checked out. Same thing with cutting. Same thing with thinking about suicide. These are symptoms, not sins. Thank you. Dr. Sure. Riley, we had a yes, question that ties right to this about asking if you could go a little bit further with the incentives and reinforcement and maybe provide some additional examples. Of incentives? Well, uh, you have to find out, excuse me, what is 
a significant reinforcer to the kid. And what is that? I don't know. You got to ask the kid. For some kids, it's money. Uh, for other kids, it's a privilege. Um, you know, everybody's different in terms of what is a significant reinforcer. What is it that they will work for? One thing that we found, a generic kind of a trick that works surprisingly well, is you remember the old McDonald's games? Do you remember you would go and you get a piece every time you got one of those Happy Meals or whatever, and then you would paste it into the thing that they were working for, and if it all got filled in, you want? Well, sometimes a kid will say, you know, I want that, you know, terrific snowboard, or say, okay, and then you go online and you find that terrific snowboard or skateboard, longboard, and you print out two pictures, big pictures. One is in color, one's black and white. And then you take that color picture and you cut it up into pieces. And then every day they do the target, the thing you want to incentivize them to do, they get a game piece. And they take the color piece and they fit it in where it fits on the black and white. And then, and it could be that you, you say, I, I want you to work for an hour a day on schoolwork. Don't go crazy. You remember, you don't want them overwhelmed by taking on too much and they can't focus and working on screens are hard. Just any success experience is helpful. So then they get the game piece at the end of the night, you reinforce the heck out of it, way to go. And when they get the last game piece, they cash it in for that week and they get their board or, or whatever it is. So, you know, you have to find out what might be important to the kid and then find a way of putting that into a paycheck, if you will, something they can work for. So find out what's important to the kid. Don't force it on them, interview them. What might help you? Remember the secret is the kid wants to do better. That's inside every kid, no matter how far down the path of despondency and poor motivation, every kid wants to do better. So start by asking them, would you like to do better? And maybe we could work together on that. Did that get to it or do you have a follow up? Yep. Okay, should I push on through the seven C's or did you have? Sure thing. Okay, and I'll try to speak less. Sorry, I talk too much. The next C is character. That has to do with the fundamental code. Uh, character really is trying to help them understand that uh, they have tremendous power uh, through a moral code. So try to get them, maybe bribe them, incentivize them to do things, and then let them see the payoff of that and show them um, the outcome when they do something nice for grandma or for the younger sister. Um, and you know, help them understand that character is really the core of happiness. I know it's a big concept, but one of the ways you get to that is to say to them, hey, you know, what is this all about? What, what is life about? What, what is meaningful for you? Throw out these weird questions that they'll stare at you and say, well, think about it. We'll go out and get a coffee tomorrow. I'm just curious, you know, what motivates you? What is it about? Help get the wheels turning in their head. Research tells us that kids say it's all about the toys, material returns, lots of cars, uh, lots of houses, all that sort of stuff. And you want to help them think about those issues because what you're really looking for is a kid developing their own purpose and passion in the world. And that really has to do with issues of character, typically, of trying to make a difference, of helping people. Um, share your own experiences, stories where you did the right thing. And you know, a, a great story is you know, finding the wallet and returning it and not telling anybody and just saying, you know, I did a good thing today. Nobody knew about it. And I really feel good about that. So model those things for the kid. Um, uh, the next strategy overall is contribution. And contribution is trying to help them push back against that sense of helplessness and hopelessness of not having any power. And that has to do with helping them realize that most of us, most of the people listening to the seminar, nothing personal, but we live in Disney World um, and that ain't the real world. Always be referencing the real world, uh, people in need, which is most of the world and help kids get those experiences. And that's where soup kitchens or food banks, even with COVID going on, my son's doing a thing where he drives, opens up the trunk and they put the groceries in the trunk 
and he drives them to the house of you know some poor family that's stuck in a house or elderly couple and they have no food and puts the food on the doorstep and texts them and it's it's just you know he talks about how gratifying it is he just loves it it makes his day he's really annoyed if he doesn't have time to do it so help them have those experiences um and also again with the hopelessness stuff that these kids are feeling show them that it's you know one pebble at a time gets it done uh kids uh will say it's stupid what's the point you know we fed that one homeless guy you know that's stupid that doesn't change anything and you can say well the homeless guy may think differently about that son so show them in little ways have them experience the real world and then doing something to push back you know it's all about lighting candles in the darkness another metaphor to use because kids are just so cynical these days another thing we've measured and talk about the candle in the darkness they say yeah it's stupid it's just a candle they say yeah it's true but if you're in a dark room and there's a candle burning what do you look at where does your eye go and that's the way it is with doing good things, with making a contribution in the world. Next is coping. And that's kind of an easy one. That's like how you handle these terrible stressors. And uh, a lot of that, again, is modeling. Talk about your own process of coping. Talk about your fears. You're not supposed to act John Wayne. You're supposed to say, yeah, I got to do this uh, Zoom seminar tonight, and I really get nervous doing these things. I tell my kids that all the time. They say, you do? You've been doing them all your life. I say, yeah, I know. I still get nervous, but it's okay. It's okay to be nervous. It doesn't mean you run away. You step up and you do the thing, and I always feel better after I just do the thing. Uh, so narrate your own emotions, your own experience. Don't lecture to them. Um, model the serenity prayer. And you don't have to be religious. <laughs> the serenity prayer is, man, it's hundreds of years old. It is so um, in vogue these days. What is that? That's grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, uh, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's the smartest set of words I ever heard. And again, you don't have to be religious. It's basic psychology. And show them what that means. And that's where you say, I, I can't get rid of COVID. I can't bring back half a million people. We can make some sandwiches and hand them out. We can do a, a tour at the food bank. What do you say? And that becomes incredible gold to these kids. It does give them uh, these missing pieces, things they've lost through the pandemic. And then the obvious one, you know, the three legs of the stool of wellness, sleep, diet, and exercise. And I hope none of your parents ask me how you get them to sleep. Well, you may, and then we'll talk about that. But um, yeah, it, that it's really critical. And again, model it. Don't lecture them. Don't fight them over it. Just show them how much better you feel when you eat well and you get some exercise and you get uh, enough sleep. And finally, uh, the last C is control. And we call that the serenity prayer part two. And that's where you talk about how actually most of the things that happen to us do happen as a result of someone's actions and choices um, focus again on their successes remind them that they have succeeded there's things they've done well because they're all focused on what they are not and you got to remind them of what they have done well and affirm their successes link their autonomy with responsibility when a kid wants more freedom then you say, great, in the world, we earn freedom with responsibility. You make good choices, you get more freedom. It's the way the world works. If you make poor choices, you lose freedom, but you can earn it back. Same with the kid. If they're making good choices about drugs and sex and rock and roll, violence, sorts of things, say, so you, you, you know, we keep playing out the line. But if they make bad choices, you pull back the line a bit, nothing drastic, nothing personal, because in a couple of months, you'll make better choices and you play it out again. And I'm going to stop yammering at that point. Can we get some more questions or complaints, issues? What's going on? Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, we had um, a parent um, ask, how do we reconcile all your sage advice with the competitive real world of college entry scholarship pressure? Oh. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for asking. Guys, out there called 
where you go is not who you'll be. Get the book. If you're caught up in this college madness stuff, read this book. Um, it's, it's a review of a lot of the research. You know, we, we have this thing in this country about if you go to an elite college, you're going to be great. Everything's fine. And it's nonsense. In fact, most of the research shows a downside to kids that get into these super elite schools because they push themselves so hard. Some kids, you know, they're like SEALs, Navy SEALs. They, they can do that. Most kids are not wired to do that. <clears throat> You gotta focus on what's important, which is their heart. Hearts in line, achievement follows. I had a girl one time, one of my failure cases named Becky. And Becky's I think, mom was a surgeon and dad was a famous courtroom attorney. And you know, I was supposed to get Becky to fulfill her potential because she wouldn't take AP courses. You know, she had B, C, D. Great kid, extremely bright. Her heart was great. She's doing all sorts of community service and you know, just a wonderful kid. And she was a failure. Parents were really annoyed. She didn't get into an elite college. Years later, I got a letter from her. Dear Dr. Bradley, this is Becky. Remember me? Um, guess from where I just graduated? NYU, a prestigious great school. She wrote NYU, ha ha ha. Can you believe it? And when I talked to Becky, she, again, the parents were wise. They didn't go to war over, you got to get into an elite college. She went to, God forbid, community college. Don't tell anybody. She learned how to study. And then she figured out what she was passionate about, turned it on, transferred to NYU. I didn't know you could do that. And, you know, she's on her way. So, guys, don't go to, be careful what hill you want to die on. You know, I'm sorry, but the great grades to get into the great college is not the hill. You first focus on the heart and then the achievement follows. Do what you can for the grades, but you don't make the kid feel that they are not worthwhile, that you don't love them because they don't do well academically. When I go to conventions, we sit around and play, where'd you go to, where'd you get your doctorate from and see who went to an elite school. Most of us who have you know, done okay, done some things, went to, God forbid, state schools. Sorry, it's just, I went to Temple back in the day that was not considered elite. Um, it's all about the heart, you know, not the resume of the child. So relax, parents, do what you can. If the heart is good, congratulate yourselves, consider it a success and move on. Offer them some bribes to get better grades, but don't let them feel the loss of connection. Dr. Bradley, um, you know, we look at these uh, seven competencies and I, and I think to myself, let's be real, I didn't do a lot of those. So how can I, how can I kind of roll it back as a parent, you know, in the middle of a pandemic with a lot of stress that's happening? How can I roll back some of my mistakes, some of the things that I did that I wish I could take back and try to, um, uh, and try to kind of, you know, start, start again and get things rolling and help my child really get on the right foot. Thank you for saying that and welcome to the club. And again, it's that same mantra about you sit down with the kid and you do the thing we want the kid to do, which is to say, you know, I've been thinking about stuff and I think I made some bad calls. I, you know, I should not have pushed you into that football or into the AP course. I am so sorry. That was, that was not okay on my part. Uh, and there's no excuses. By the way, when we apologize, you don't use the word but. You don't use the phrase you got to understand. It, that becomes a rationalization. It's not an apology. You just do the one-sided thing. Your kid's eyes will fly wide open. <laughs> They just say, oh, my God, you know, big, powerful mom makes mistakes and owns it. Uh, and by the way, moms usually are good at the apology thing. Dads don't do that. We think it's weakness. I've had da dads tell me, oh, no, he'll think I'm weak and take advantage of me. Are you kidding? You'll never be bigger in the eyes of a child than when you make yourself small with an apology. It's incredible how bowed, bowed over they are. 
and by the way, teachers as well, when you lose it and you scream at a kid or belittle them, apologize the next morning alone and watch their eyes. They are stunned. They, they just are so moved when we admit to being human beings and saying, I have to make this better. How do I pay you back for this? What do I do? And then you can talk about some of the things maybe you wish you had done better without pushing them or asking them to counter apologize. So it's never too late, Rita. It's never, you know, it's only too late when they're putting you in the ground. It's never too late prior to that. We have all these options of setting things straight. So don't miss those opportunities. And actually, I can't believe it. I talk so much. We're like at the end of this. Is there one more question you want to ask or should I wrap? Just there's a hand raised in, um, and we're not taking questions that way, but if the person who has their hand raised wants to drop it in the Q&A, we can take that and one or two more real quick. You know, I think one of the things for me, and I, I, I think about this, you know, as, as a parent, but also as an educator. And, you know, we really expect a lot from our kids in terms of how they, you know, um, behave in school or how they behave at home or how they behave in church or in the community. And our children really are, are pleasers, right? They really want to make us happy and do that. And some of that, I think, creates a level of stress in student and, and children that is yeah. probably probably not a good thing. How do we how do we as parents um, really emphasize to them that it's okay not to be perfect, that what they're seeing on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is was the, the result mm -hmm. of a lot of sales before they were able to, you know, post the picture or the video. Yeah, the social media stuff. You know, wish we had another couple of hours. It just makes me crazy. Everybody posts the A side. Remember A side of records and B side. <laughs> I'm a loser and I'm terrible and everybody hates me. And, you know, it's it, it just makes people you know FOMO, fear of missing out stuff. It is just awful. Um, I think it's just really important to when a kid identifies a specific person that they feel they are not as good as. Help them process that. Is that somebody who is being open and honest or somebody who's you know, putting on a show on Facebook? You know, do you believe all these people have perfect lives? You know, ask these questions so that the kid can process it. By the way, if they'll go for it, try the one week with no social media trick. So many kids don't turn on the social media sites after they've been away for a week we did this with our daughter one time. Our daughter is a child of color and she was getting racial threats and so forth. And we said, sorry, we got to shut it off. <clears throat> and she was a different child, you know, a week without the social media stuff, trying to manage 200 people's perceptions. You know, oh my God, talk about a stressor. You know, how many bullies did you have in high school? I had one that I had to deal with. These kids will have 200 that can come after them on a social media site. So talk to them, help them see their own experience a bit, help them see the lunacy of it and make suggestions, offer a bribe to take, you know, a time off from the social media because I think they then get a perspective on it. Um, what advice do you have for parents who are trying to get help for their, um, for their child and they're having a hard time finding someone who's taking a new patient or a young child? Yeah, it just, you got to search, uh, ask people who know, people at school, uh, ask the pediatrician, if you're religious, ask the pastor, priest, um, rabbi, find out, and, and you hear names coming a couple of times, and then take your best shot. Um, as parents, it's better that you make the first connection. If you can, insist on giving a history, uh, go in alone the first time or on screen the first time. So you can judge whether this person would be a good fit with your child or not. Because a, a terrible experience is a disaster because kids then say, oh, they're all crazy. They're all like Dr. Bradley, he's horrible. I'm not seeing anybody. So you psych them out first. And then secondly, say to the kid, 
I'm just asking that you see this person a couple of times. You're in charge, sweetheart. If you don't like the guy, you don't have to go back. We'll find somebody else. So let them feel they have some choice, but you set up the fence of saying they have to see someone, particularly if you see this kind of struggle of self-injury and complete lack of motivation, not getting out of bed, it's time to see somebody. So if I can, Ken Raff, um, if you take a look at the Ten Commandments, the last commandment is, this too shall pass. And that's about a prediction of the future, which is, guys, it does get better. As parents, we do the same thing our kids do. We tend to think this is forever, that what you see in your child now is going to be what you'll see when they're 40. That's not true. Most kids still do just fine, even with these terrible stressors. Uh, kids do have an ability to become resilient if they're not already resilient. They're flexible. They're very plastic. You can make these changes quickly and see some immediate responses if you follow a few, few general rules. First is stop fearing failure. Again, see problems, crises, as wonderful learning opportunities. <laughs> when the kid does something hideous and you're just, I can't believe this, you say, thank you because I get a chance to address this while my child is in my house, not a thousand miles away on a college campus, and I have no idea what's going on. Because now you can teach, not control, but teach the child to be able to control herself. So stop being so terrified of these problems. They're supposed to be there. That's your job as a parent. That's why you get paid the big bucks, is to be there to help kids through these crises. Second, <clears throat> focus on the heart about a hundredth time I've said it tonight. It's about values, character. Those things are what build resilience. And once the heart is in place, once a kid feels purpose and passion in the world, like, yeah, I really want to do this thing, get out of their way. If their values are good, they feel like they have some control over their lives. It's not about the batting averages and the grades. They can make it up. Our son was one of those mediocre mediocre high school student. And then he learned he really prizes education. He's finishing his master's degree, doing great, you know, straight A's, very passionate about teaching. I tried to talk him out of it, but he insists. So, you know, maybe you guys can talk to him for me. He just loves it. He loves working with kids. He found his passion. Um, pick your battles. Be careful about what hill you want to die on, guys. Think about, you know, red orange and yellow priorities. What's in the yellow basket? Messy rooms. What's in the orange basket? Well, a little bit more concerning grades, but you don't go nuts. What's in the red basket? The values, the hard stuff, compassion, um, being tolerant of other people. Um, those are the things you really want to focus on. Build the heart. Remember your mission, guys. Your mission as parents is not to raise an Ivy League freshman. You know what your real mission is? It's to raise the parent of your grandchildren. This is what it's about. This is how we get close to touching the face of infinity. Our kids will be who we are, not what we tell them. They will study it. it scares the hell out of me when I read the research on that. And by the way, my son just had a baby. We have a seven month old grandchild, first one. And oh my God, all this stuff I've studied and preached, it's true. He's the most amazing parent. He's 10 times better than I was. It's magical to watch him with this little baby. And I remember all the battles, the bad choices I made to try to make him fulfill his potential back in the day. And I'm saying, it's not about that. It's not about the grades. It's not about the batting average. It's about the heart. And it's breathtaking when you see it. And you will see it. Um, think about your legacy. What do you want to pass down to that grandchild? You want to pass down coldness, anger, criticism, rejection? Are those the gifts you want to leave forever? How about things like compassion, acceptance, support, and love, especially in the face of provocation when they're making you crazy and you're able to hold on to your discipline, say, hey, I love you. I just disagree with you. And if you lose it, apologize and show them that it is about the heart. <clears throat> I'll tell you my two best tricks. 
My first one, I can't get published. I've tried. They tell me the title is awful. It's called the deathbed exercise. Um, so if you have a better title, please send it to me. What's that? Before I freak out on kids, when the kids were in the house, I'd always go into the garage and say, all right, Mike, before you go King Kong over the latest issue, how will you feel on your deathbed as you're reviewing your life about what you're about to do tonight? Got it. Thank you. And you remember what's important. And that's where you go in and you hug your daughter, as I used to do, and say, Sarah, it's so good to see you. I really missed you on this trip. And I heard you worked really hard in that rugby game. And I'm so proud of you. I just want you to tell you that you're like the light of my life. And could you help me with these 10,000 Chinese food boxes that are all over the room again? So it helps you to prioritize things. And finally, humor, guys. <clears throat> humor gets us through these times. It's part of the order of the good time. They would tell jokes. They would put on funny plays. Humor is the last defense of cops in a squad car and a bad neighbor in the middle of the night and soldiers in foxholes. It's making jokes, especially in the worst of times. Uh, Cindy and I, <clears throat> my wife, when our kids were in terrible times and we had some terrible teenage times, we had this cartoon we would always refer to. It was in the New Yorker and it's a middle-aged couple on opposing couches and they're reading books and one looks up at the other and says, you know, sweetheart, now that the children are all in jail, maybe we can take that trip we always plan. So don't forget to keep laughing, focus on what's important, focus on the heart, the rest falls into place. Keep your heads down. Good luck out there, guys. And thanks for coming tonight. Dr. Bradley, I want to thank you so much for just these gems of information and knowledge that you've shared with us. There's a lot here to digest in an hour and a half. We could go on all night, I'm sure. I know that there's some folks that have questions and the um, con Dr. Bradley's contact information is on the handouts if you um, want to um, follow up with him. Um, Dr. Bradley, I would like to thank you. I'd like to thank the Upper Dublin Education Foundation, um, members of our um, leadership team and Dr. Yanni. This has been a fabulous evening. We thank you. And on behalf of um, the administration of the Upper Dublin School District, I want to um, wish everyone a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You did the hard part putting all this together. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Bradley. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you again for your support, Michelle. And you, Daph, yeah. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Bradley. Thank you guys. Take care. Be well. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everyone.